We are live. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, very much of a pleasure today to be at the COP27 for this very important event on investing in and financing the acceleration of sustainable development in a net zero scenario. Uh, we are really now tackling the role of high income uh, countries. Uh, we have seen that energy transition and achieving the goals of uh, Paris Agreement is societal priority uh, involving a multitude of players, be it the private sector, the public sector, and also the civil society. Financial institutions are intermediaries between savings and investment and have major role in really financing our economies. We are moving from what I call the reference model into a sustainable and inclusive model that you have to be compliant with the net zero scenario and decarbonization scenario. So ensure uh, the financial sector has a very key uh, role to play to mobilize the ne needed resources to tackle climate change, mitigation and, uh, and adaptation. And banks, in fact, uh, have been engaged very much in sustainable finance and committed uh, to uh, the Paris Agreement and also to uh, the principle of responsible uh, banking. This is extremely important because in fact, uh, we are all facing the climate risk. Household also uh, need to be aware that their savings are really, in, uh, um, uh, they are used to finance uh, the sustainable uh, economy. And also depositors and all the uh, other stakeholders uh, have to be aware that uh, their money is also used for uh, sustainable purposes. So the role of consumers, it's extremely important to ensure that they are also aligned and they are part ex uh, stakeholders for uh, this uh, model change uh, towards sustainable financial uh, systems. Today we have a very uh, important and very distinguished panelist uh, uh, for to discuss uh, this, uh, this, this topic. And this uh, will allow us, uh, will allow me first of all to uh, introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Jose Manuel uh, Campa. Jose Manuel Campa, he is uh, the chair of the European Banking Authority and he has been uh, very much uh, involved into really pushing the regulatory framework into sustainability. Since we are uh, starting a bit late, Jose Manuel, I don't know if you are online. Jose Manuel, yes. To provide yes. yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Good morning, Jose Manuel. Welcome to uh, this session. We are all here greeting you from uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Do you hear us? Thank you. Very well. I hear you very well. Yes, and I see you as well. Thank you. So the floor is yours, Jose Manuel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning to everybody, and thank you for the invitation. You know, tackling climate change, I think it starts with the question: what we all can do about it. Each one of us needs to provide our own answer. And that includes, of course, the financial sector. Therefore, I'm pleased to join this COP27 event to discuss what banks, regulators, and in particular, the European Banking Authority can and is doing to contribute to tackle this challenge. We speak of climate as a global common good. Likewise, international financial st stability has the characteristics of also such a common good. We as financial regulators understand this and all of us have a shared interest in its preservation. But sometimes we only resort to action when this common good is eroding. In the case of the financial system, we have to reach a tipping point, the global financial crisis to make fundamental changes. These changes also included how we collaborated on banking regulation in Europe. In fact, it was in 2008 when we had to realize that our efforts and institutions did not prevent serious risks for financial stability from materializing. In the European Union, the financial turmoil and the economic and social hardship triggered the complete overhaul of the system of financial regulation supervision. To that end, the European Union set up a, the European system of financial supervision with the European supervisory authorities and regulatory bodies of which among those, the European Banking Authority was established to help building a single regulatory framework for the entire banking sector in the 27 member states. At the EBA, therefore, I can te testify that we have learned the lesson that institutionalized dialogue and coordination matter, that proper and early regulatory action can help foster change and prevent unintended consequences. But we're also very much aware that any common good needs constant attention and scrutiny by all the stakeholders. And these lessons apply to achieving the goals towards a net zero transition. We need to continue to engage and reiterate our commitment to the actions that need to be taken by each of us to contribute to the global response required to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. 
Let me address first the role of climate considerations in the banking sector, as Rimo already started to elaborate. Banks play an important role when it comes to climate change. On one hand, banks will be crucial in financing the transition towards a more resource efficient and sustainable economy. They will also have to cater for customer demand for sustainable products. On the other hand, financial institutions will have to adhere themselves to sustainability standards. The World Economic Forum recently estimated that approximately 50 trillion US dollars in incremental investment are needed by 2050 to transition the global economy to net zero emissions and avert a climate catastrophe. In addition, Global clean energy investments of approximately 4 trillion US dollars are required annually by, annually by 2030, with some more than threefold increase from existing investment levels now. Energy supply shortages as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine may even accelerate this transition. Moreover, in line with decisions at prior COP conference, developed countries committed themselves to a collective goal of mobilizing 100 billion US dollars per year until 2025 for climate action in developing countries and more may be needed. Those finance needs coincide with the growing volume of green bond issuance in global financial markets. Green bond issuance broke through a half trillion mark for the first time in 2021, ending with over $500 billion of, of issuance, a 75% increase relative to 2020. Zooming into the European Union, the European Commission will become the largest green bond issuer worldwide as part of the issuance under the next generation EU program. As a result, banks are needed for providing their expertise to structure these investment products, identify investors, and act as underwriters to these large issuers. But much more will be required from banks in this transition. Whole sectors of economic activity will need their support to be able to transition business models and related operations towards green. This means providing expert advice, direct funding through lending, and adequately assessing the related risks. Climate change also confronts banks with challenges which manifest through already existing risk channels. More frequent and severe weather events pose risk to firms and operations and supply chains, as well as to those of their counterparties. It may cause physical damage to real estate and infrastructure and impact generally on some businesses' viability. Such events will likely have an impact on the riskiness of the bank's existing loan portfolios. As a result, banks face additional operational and credit risk, which requires precise measurement, adequate risk management, and may need dedicated provisioning. The same goes for other climate events like rising sea levels or changes in temperature. In addition, banks will need to adjust to new regulations and invest on early identification of relevant risks to avoid legal and reputational risks themselves. Last year already, the EBA conducted a pilot mapping exercise of a sample of 29 volunteer banks in 10 jurisdictions in the EU, covering 50% of the overall EU banking system assets. It was a data classification exercise to map banks' exposure from a climate risk perspective. I must say it was a learning exercise for both the EBA and participating banks. Our scenario analysis looked at banks' sensitivity to the process of adaptation in light of climate change. According to our analysis, we estimated that the exposures towards high carbon obligers amounts to almost 25% of banks' corporate non-SME holdings in the sample. Climate-relevant exposures was concentrated in manufacturing and electricity sectors mainly. As our analysis continues, it is getting clear that banks might be underestimating transition risk in the short and medium term. Banks may engage too much capital in activities that reform climate change or in companies and projects with an inadequate management of climate-related risks. Moreover, they may also be securing loans with assets subject to increased transitional and fiscal risks. So what are we doing in the ABA as a priority our environmental agenda? Well, I must say that the environmental, social, and governance risks are a multi-year horizontal priority for the ABA. Our climate-related agenda is part of our overall sustainability agenda, but a fundamental part of that agenda. At the same time, we're constantly balancing the urgent C4 action with the buildup of sufficient data to inform our regulatory work. As EBA, we follow a sequential approach focusing at this chapter on better embedding climate-related risk in institutions' practice, practices and fostering transparency on ESG risk in banks' balance sheets, enhancing their measurement, modeling, and management of these risks by banks and supervisory authorities. Until now, we have provided recommendations on ESG risk management and supervision. Those recommendations specify definitions and methodologies and give guidance on how to incorporate ESG considerations in the strategies and objectives, as well as governance arrangements. We also updated relevant EBA products to reflect the growing materiality of ESG risks in the overall activities of financial institutions. 
For example, our EBA guidelines on loan origination and our guidelines on remuneration by financial institutions have been amended to include ESG considerations when banks make such important decisions. Also, for supervisory activity, our guidelines on the supervisory review and evaluation process now feature the assessment of ESG impacts as a core part. The EBA is also helping to put the EU taxonomy for sustainable activities into practice. Under EBA standards for disclosure or key ESG risks, banks are required to report on comparable data on environmental risk as well as key performance indicators in this area. The data provide more transparency on the impact of physical and transition risks on banks' balance sheet. They also show how institutions are embedding sustainability considerations in their risk management, business models, and strategy. At the same time, it will enable supervisors to assess the bank's performance on their pathway towards the Paris Agreement goals. Together with the other European supervisory authorities, we're working to improve sustainability-related disclosures for the whole financial sector. Consumers must get the right amount of information which is useful to them. They should be able to judge on the greenness of products and to compare among product offerings. To that objective, we developed standards on the content and presentation of disclosure and proposed additional disclosures for products which contribute to environmental objectives. In addition, we have put forward proposals of how to increase transparency on investment in fossil gas and nuclear energy economic activities. Looking again at the banking sector only, there is a discussion on how to ensure that ESG risks are properly reflected in the bank's capital requirements. The EBA is an active contributor to this debate. Over the summer, we published a discussion paper with our preliminary views and sought to open a discussion and receive feedback on the best way to approach this issue. We have received ample feedback from stakeholders and this feedback will be included in our report to be delivered in 2023 to enhance the framework. Now preempting the final statement in the report, we would however like to stress that it's important that our potential response on the ESG matters remains risk-based. Going forward, we will continue to deliver more work on ESG risk management, we will advise the European Commission on what should be our common understanding on what greenwashing means in the financial sector and the best ways to monitor and tackle it if necessary to ensure that what's sold as green is really green. Without financial stability, the already challenging transition to a net zero economy will be much more difficult to achieve. Proper and quick preparation by financial institutions and preserving financial stability are fundamental while we go through this transition to a sustainable economy. Thorough monitoring of ESG risks will also continue to be at the forefront of our agenda. We'll work with financial institutions, bank supervisors, and other authorities across the financial sector to stress test and assess the robustness of the financial sector to the challenges and the risks that may arise in this transition. The result of this exercise will be published in 2024 and will certainly provide further evidence on how to best adjust the framework for sustainable finance and guide our decisions our, dec our decisive actions on climate change to reach our targets. Let me conclude with some final reflections. Going forward, a well-funded and stable banking system will be the backbone of the transition to provide adequate financing to our investment needs. Well-capitalized and resilient banks are good news in the fact fight against climate, climate change. Only a sound and resilient financial system will help to facilitate the financing towards a low-carbon economy and to mitigate the disruptive impacts of environmental risk. Second, the banks have made progress, but they still need to accelerate and truly manage climate-related environmental risk like we expect them to manage any other material risk. This includes managing expected losses and their institutions overall soundness to potential unexpected scenarios as we progress through this transition. Third is collaboration. The EBA is proudly joining the European Commission's leadership ambition on ESG matters. At the same time, we must make sure that ESG standards across the globe remain comparable. I touch upon the importance of institutional dialogue and coordination. We need to have common reference points around ESG to advance in our work. It is important to open dialogue to stakeholders from different sectors and regions around the world. Only such dialogue will consolidate our joint understanding of net zero and how to achieve it. In that regard, I'm looking forward to both panels on how to foster climate considerations in financial regulation internationally. Thank you very much for the invitation again. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel. Do you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Uh, very well. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel, for this uh, keynote. I think you alluded at all the work that EBA has been doing on the regulatory framework, advising the European Commission 
And we are very pleased to say that as the chair of the banking stakeholder group, we've been working with the European Banking Authority hand in hand to really provide some advice also to the uh, regulatory standards, particularly on the sustainable finance. And I, uh, and I also would like to mention that we are in the preparation of a, a statement uh, to really uh, say what are the main issues related to uh, sustainable finance and how to accelerate the transition uh, into a, um, a net zero scenario. Thank you very much for this and please stay with us for the discussion. Uh, our next speaker is Frank Alderson. Uh, Frank is uh, the executive board member and vice chair of the supervisory board of the European Central Bank. Uh, and he is, uh, has been also overseeing the ECB legal services. And then uh, thank you very much, Frank, for join, uh, joining us. Please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And apologies for not having been able to come uh, and be with you there in, in person. Um, at the COP26 a year ago, uh, as the outgoing chair of the Central Banks and Supervisors Network for Green the Financial System, the NGFS, I presented the NGFS Glasgow Declaration entitled Committed to Action. And with this declaration, um, the members of the NGFS, 100 central banks and supervisors at the time, and now 121, reiterated their willingness to contribute to the global response required to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And we made concrete commitments on what we will work on and deliver in the coming years, covering all the core activities of the network of central banks and supervisors. I have since passed the baton of chairing the NGFS to Ravi Manon, the managing director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Yet, in my role as a member of the European Central Bank's executive board and vice chair of the supervisory board, I am part of an institution that is not taking the Glasgow Declaration lightly. Quite the contrary. Across all the European Central Bank's tasks and responsibilities, including monetary policy, banking supervision, financial stability monitoring, and all our operational duties, we have taken and we continue to take further action to incorporate the consequences of the ongoing climate and environmental crises into our work. In our monetary policy, for example, last month, we started tilting our corporate bond purchases towards issuers with a better climate performance. And in our work as banking supervisors, we have continued to roll out what I previously described as an immersive approach to the supervision of climate-related and environmental risks. An approach in which these risks are fully integrated into the day-to-day -day activities of our joint supervisory teams, which are constantly um, contact, in constant contact with the banks. An approach in which climate-related and environmental risks come to form an integral part of our ongoing dialogue with supervised entities and our supervisory review and evaluation process, which ultimately affects banks' capital requirements. An encompassing and integrated approach that is not new to supervisors or banks because it is one that we have been taking for years for all other sources of risk that we supervise, an approach that will be here to stay. Our interactions with the banks we supervise show that they are already making progress and they have finally started to put in place the basic infrastructure needed to identify, monitor, assess and control climate related and environmental risks. Now, all progress should be celebrated. For the banks under our supervision, we are contributing to this by proactively sharing the good practices we seek. But let me be clear. Let me be clear. 
that all progress is ultimately just a means to an end. And that end can be one thing only. Practices and policies that are fully aligned with a Paris compatible transition path. And this is why when taking the first set of climate related actions in our monetary policy, we committed to regularly reviewing all the relevant measures to ensure that they continue to support the decarbonization path to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement and the EU's climate neutrality objectives. This is why last week ECB banking supervision communicated deadlines by which we expect banks risk management strategies to be fully aligned with our supervisory expectations in the area of climate related and environmental risks. This is why, despite the progress that we have seen, I will continue to stress that the banks under our supervision need to step up their game and truly manage climate related and environmental risks in the same way that we expect them to manage any other material risks. This is why we support the European Commission's proposal that banks should be legally required to put in place prudential supervision transition plans, which enable them to assess their risk exposures and the effectiveness of their risks controls in a world that is transitioning to net zero. This is why we ourselves will soon start to disclose data on climate risk exposure and the carbon footprint of our own asset portfolios, a commitment that covers all national central banks in the euro system. And this is why we urgently need to continue moving ahead. Our road to Sharm al Sheikh has been productive, but we cannot assess the success of our actions based on our point of departure. We need to judge our progress based on what is necessary to reach our final destination in time. And we unfortunately cannot say that we are ahead of schedule. Droughts, floods, heat waves, biodiversity loss are undeniably on the rise as very real manifestations of the climate and environmental crises. At the same time, in the European Union, we are seeing that governments are all the more committed to moving ahead with the energy transition following Russia's horrific and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. To conclude, we call on regulators, supervisors, standard setting bodies, and financial institutions to join us in answering the question, what distance do you still have to cover within your mandate to reach a Paris compatible transition path? And then join us in taking action. Join us in urgently taking all the steps necessary to ensure that our journey through Sharm al Sheikh takes us to Paris in time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, this is really clear uh, commitment uh, by the European Union regulators and supervisor, uh, European Central Bank, to really move into the tra green transition and to move into uh, really going beyond, as you mentioned, uh, the Glasgow, the Paris and Glasgow. And I hope that Sharm el Sheikh will be really uh, decisive for the role of finance uh, to combat climate change and really to move into uh, mitigate more mitigation, more adaptation as well. Thank you very much. And I think European Union is t taking the leadership, uh, not only at uh, a global level on these uh, matters, but also uh, on the financial level. And I think this commitment has to continue. And I look now to the European Investment Bank. Uh, European Investment Bank has been one of the key banks really uh, committed into uh, a green transition. I think uh, Europe has been uh, one of the uh, uh, really 
um, important institutions uh, in the European Union, also active globally uh, into uh, the green transition and also uh, aligning to the decarbonization uh, scenario. Uh, with me here I have Ayla Cravey. Uh, Ayla, she is the Chief Sustainable Financial Advisor of the European uh, Investment Bank and uh, today she is with us. Please, Ayla, the floor uh, is yours. She is with us here in Sharm el Sheikh. Thank you, Rima. And um, uh, thanks to the previous speakers, it's very good to speak after EBA and ECB. We are all part of the EU family and all work against the same uh, objectives and goals in our respective roles, of course. So the role of a promotional bank, um, I'm putting this also to the European context, but the way we work and uh, what we work, and uh, we it's all, it's very similar. It's based on the same principle, on the same objectives inside EU and outside EU. So here we are, of course, in the Mediterranean context, but what I say is applicable sort of globally on our activity. So a promotional bank like, uh, like, uh, like us, we of course operate in the policy framework of our shareholders. And for us, this is the EU, i.e. E European Green Deal, Euro EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan, all of this, we, we are very much part of that. So we want to address the environmental and social challenges uh, that, that, that we have. At the same time, keeping the growth on the table as well. So it's also a growth plan. Um, so we have, um, on the request of our shareholders, we have put more focus on climate and environmental activities, so much that we have uh, labeled ourselves now the EU Climate Bank. Um, so this, uh, we started in November 2019 by changing a little bit the focus of our activities. Well, not a little bit, actually, it was quite important moves. Um, so we decided that um, uh, out of our annual activity, half would go to climate and environmental uh, projects financing by 2025. Actually, we are ahead of schedule. We are there already. Um, the other half will be a lot of different things, but none of it can do any significant harm, so it needs to be Paris aligned in that way as well. Um, we set as a target that from 2021 to for the next decade, we would mobilize, including the co-financing, one trillion of uh, uh, climate and environmental financing. Um, and uh, and uh, we also wanted uh, really to see this framework, how we align everything uh, with, with the Paris Agreement that we do, not only the environmental lending. So it has changed a little bit uh, uh, to what we lend, um, but I think if we think about the role of the promotional bank, one can say that, first of all, promotional bank, public sector bank, usually has a good rating, so we can raise large volumes, uh, long maturities of funding, which means that we can do the same on the lending side. So we typically lend large volumes and 20, 30 year maturities are not <coughs> a problem, which means that you can finance infrastructure project in a manner which is suitable to the needs of the, of the, of the clients. These are typically renewable power generation, it can be transmission systems, uh, low carbon technologies uh, in, in other fields as well. Um, Part of the promotional bank's uh, role is also to go and support technologies, for example, which are not quite as uh, mature or so mature that private sector capital will jump on them voluntarily. We did this 15 years ago with, for example, offshore wind. We went in there and gradually it has become, of course, everybody's uh, favorite asset nowadays. Um, we are doing now the same with the floating offshore wind, which is not a mature technology yet on an industrial scale, but it's a very, very promising one if it can be made such. And we finance one such wind farm um, off the coast of Portugal. We are looking at other similar projects as well. So this is one of the roles that we definitely see for, for, for public bank. Uh, I think it's also in the public bank's role um, at the other end of this uh, sort of um, size scale uh, to look to support the smaller businesses wh where innovation very often happen, not only there, but very often, even at the level of starts up. And we have several schemes there, uh, more most of the time together with the European Commission where we share the risk um, to support the small enterprises where they have important innovations ongoing in the environmental and climate field. And um, it's often said, I know that, well, public sector or government cannot really pick the winners in the SMEs and in the, in the startups. But this is the, 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 the point of the case is that you do not need to pick the winners. 
when you go to that level of, of, of sort of um, uh, not mature uh, companies and markets, you will lose some and you will win some. That's perfectly normal and to be expected. But the most important thing for a public sector bank who uses public money is not to pick the sure losers. So don't go and put money into the areas and objectives and investments which are against your policy goals. So for example, why would you now put money to fossil fuel investments which lock in fossil for another 20, 30 years? That's a sure loser. As long as you don't put your money on that one, you can see where you win and where you lose on the smaller ones. So this is something that we see very much in the, in the role of a, uh, of a public sector bank. So what has this meant for us, for example? We, we don't, of course, tell anybody that any, any of their activities is legal or should be banned or not financed. But since we don't have unlimited resources, we have to see where we put the money. So with this climate bank, um, uh, we revised, uh, indeed, uh, uh, our sort of sectoral criteria, what we do and what we don't do. So just to give you a couple of examples. So any power generation project which uh, uh, results in lifetime emissions greater than 250 grams of um, uh, uh, carbon per kilowatt hour, we will not do. Um, projects that expand agricultural activity into um, high carbon stock areas, we don't finance. Um, airport expansions, we could do, for example, airport security, but we don't do airport expansions. Uh, and new energy, uh, uh, new energy intensive, so high uh, emitting industrial power plants. If it's not their energy efficiency, that we would not do either. So um, we don't support the high emitting and the uh, those sectors unless it is for their transition, indeed. So th that is, of course, the most important role of the pu public bank where they put their money. But we also have. Uh, plenty of advisory and expertise on the offer, either as a formal program or as an informal program, which is very important, especially outs outside the EU, where you need support to put a pipeline together and structure those investments. And uh, I'm referring then to what the previous speakers have said about the EU uh, regulation and EU taxonomy and, and, and all of that framework. We have been obviously a big part of developing, uh, for example, the taxonomy. Uh, we have committed now to use uh, the taxonomy as a reference to our environmental and climate lending. And uh, um, uh, we are also, I feel, <laughs> very often some kind of informal ambassadors of the taxonomy because we talk about this to, to everybody and his brother, usually in, uh, in lots of events, in meetings, in, uh, in all kinds of forms, uh, explaining a bit what it is. And we also try to work now with the banking sector, for example, that uh, this is not a done deal yet, but so that we could offer an intermediate intermediate pro program for uh, energy efficiency of, of, of uh, uh, houses, mortgages, and this would obviously need to be along the, the, the criteria of the, of the taxonomy as well. So those are, I think, some of the most important roles of a public sector bank. Thank you very much. Uh, this is really interesting uh, experience also for the European Union and could be uh, used for other countries and having uh, the role of uh, EIB uh, going forward in also developing countries that you have a very strong action and you could be really the push for uh, much more, uh, I would say, acceleration of the, uh, of the sustainable transition on those countries toward the Paris Agreement. This is really great and thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, our next speaker is Sonia Gibbs. Uh, Sonia, she is the Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at the Institute of International Finance. We heard uh, that th there is a need for commitment of the financial sector globally, and I think there is a clear commitment. Please, Sonia, the floor is yours. So what have you done and what you are going to do going forward? Well, thank you so much um, for putting together this really timely and, and pertinent event. And I just want to set out a few perspectives from the private financial sector, being the only private sector representative here, drawing on our work at the IIF and our global membership. And one key link I want to make is, is between climate risk management and transition planning on one hand and actual transition finance on the other hand. And in fact, we've committed as the private financial sector to both, right? To managing climate risk, to transition planning, and to transition finance. So it's really important to make those two things work together. And if you think about it in the context of an individual bank, for example, 
the people doing risk management the people and the people doing lending and investment typically are, are siloed, right? They're working in different parts of the institution. So the portfolio managers and bankers out there making deals and investments, aren't, they're not thinking about the safety and soundness of the balance sheet every single day. And the chief risk officers and compliance people are not thinking about uh, the next big business opportunity. But in sustainability and sustainable finance, which is so cross-cutting across an organization, you, we are seeing much more connection between the different parts of the organization. And it's kind of existential. If you cannot, if you cannot um, plan and implement transition to net zero without a whole firm approach, just like it can't be done in countries without a whole economy approach. So, and that also underlies the work of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS, that has work streams across all these functions, from transition planning and portfolio alignment to mobilizing capital. They have to go hand in hand, these things. So then, of course, there's lots of questions about how we define transition finance. What counts as transition finance? And the EU taxonomy certainly lies a, a strong foundation there. But another way to look at it is that Transition finance is an evolution of traditional development finance. So that includes financing the green, and whether that's solar, wind, carbon capture, new technology, and financing the brown, turning brown sectors green. And that was an interesting point that uh, Jose Manuel Campa made in the, the survey, the EBA survey, noting that something like a quarter of bank exposures are to these high emission sectors and they need to be supported in transition as well. So both sides, financing the green, greening the brown, are essential to meeting global climate targets. And we know there's nowhere near enough public money in the world to address the financing gap for climate and sustainable development goals. So by supporting the transition of our clients and the firms that we invest in, the private financial sector is effectively expanding the global capital pool. And I want to highlight the commitment that the private financial sector has made and that the me momentum from Glasgow is continuing. This is con essential, just as Frank said a minute ago. You know, we've got to maintain this momentum, maintain this commitment. And because we're here at COP, I want to say just a few words about the need for climate and SDG finance in emerging markets specifically and the urgency of capital mobilization. And this is not an easy time for emerging markets investing, right? You've got global rates going up, you've got inflation, you have a strong US dollar, fears about global recession. There's a lot of risk aversion out there. In fact, our estimates suggest that capital outflows from emerging markets are now as bad as they were during the 2013 taper tantrum. So we have to look beyond the difficult environment of the moment. How do we ensure sustained inflows of private capital, which are so essential for growth and development goals? A lot of this will come from traditional public sector sources, but to scale up private capital means de-risking. It means more partnership with multilateral development banks, promotional banks, as Isla just mentioned, you know, the blended finance spectrum. There's a lot of potential there to scale that and make it much more effective. And so does green and ESG investment more generally, a lot of potential to plug the gap. But the investment needs to be credible. We've talked about greenwashing risk, for example. You've got to have good data, good impact assessment, and good disclosure. And all of this, as Frank said, underpins transition planning as well. So what does it mean, good ESG data? It's got to capture financial firms' exposures to climate risk, including physical and transition across supply chains. And that's crucial to alleviating financial stability risks. That's what Jose Manuel Campo was, was noting. The financial stability risks are, are significant. It's got to accurately portray the impact of climate finance and investment, so a wider lens on impact that captures the really complex and systemic nature of climate, environmental, and social systems. You know, this whole question of just transition, it, we need to fully understand the impact of our investment in supporting just, inve just transition. The data have got to be comparable, reliable across jurisdictions. We know this, allow for forward-looking investment. 
So what are the biggest gaps and challenges? We still don't have globally consistent international reporting standards. There's been terrific work with the ISSB. You know, the EU has lots of progress, um, but we still have a ways to go there. We need better data that have consistency and granularity, especially for small firms and emerging market firms. And those are the ones that are most vulnerable to climate and most susceptible to transition. Now I'll make two final points here. Uh, one on uh, taxonomy and the other on the regulatory environment. One very important challenge is that we do have so many taxonomies out there, market developed ones like the climate bonds initiative or the green bond principles, as well as the EU taxonomy of course and country level efforts. China has a green finance policy, South Africa has one. But because climate and sustainability goals are sovereign priorities, it's hard to see that we're ever gonna get to a single global taxonomy. So instead, the G20 and other international coordination forums are promoting comparability and interoperability across different firms and, and markets. And my last point here is on the regulatory environment. And probably one of the biggest concerns we hear from our banks and other financial firms around the world is on the need for alignment in sustainable finance policy. N international financial regulation, but also alignment between official policy and regulation and voluntary commitment frameworks, the guidance being developed by GFANS and its sub-alliances like the Net Zero Banking Alliances. So it was interesting to hear a conversation with Klaus Knott and, and Mark Carney yesterday where Klaus Knott really firmly said that the FSB supports the work of GFANS in this regard. So that kind of alignment is gonna be critical to having the right environment. And in areas like transition planning, which are not currently in the formal regulatory perimeter, it is important to allow enough time and space for market-led approaches to develop. So the best thing as an industry that we can do, the private financial sector, is to help form the best consensus possible, working collaboratively with stakeholders, including regulators, policymakers, NGOs, and so on, on all in all these areas. And in this way, we can build the best possible ecosystem to support transition finance, which is so critical. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. Thank you. I think the financial sector will have a very important role in the next decades, really, to accelerate uh, the transition. And then we are hoping that all the institutions in Europe, in the United States, in other countries in Canada, they are really moving into this uh, new dynamic, what I call transformative scenario that we need to have. So from transition to action, and this is what we need to do. Uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to Monique Goens uh, from the consumer side. Uh, she's the Director General of BEUC, uh, the European Consumer Organization. She has many years of experience uh, in European countries on consumer policy. Thank you very much, Monique, to be with us. What is the role of consumers? Please, Monique. Yes, good morning, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to bring the consumer perspective to this debate. I'm aware that I'm speaking at the moment when this session should be closed, so uh, I try to be as short as possible, but I would like to say I'm also happy to be part of the European family, as was mentioned before, and uh, even if I'm coming from civil society. Monique, but I think it's a bit of echo. We don't hear you well. If, if, she has a, if you have a um, head, headset... No, I don't have headsets. Okay, so let's try to, yeah. I'm sorry for that. I hope it will work. Um, so um, what I wanted to say that, of course, um, this is about COP27. It's about uh, environment and climate and what's the role of a consumer organization there. Uh, and in fact, it is very important to include consumers in the transition to make them part of the solution. Because first of all, consumers uh, care for the environment. But it's also a question about consumers' health, huh? because a bad uh, air pollution is bad for your health, and it has also major impact on the public health uh, budget. It's also a question of safety. When you look at the disasters that have that are happening, people are losing their lives, they are losing their homes, they are losing their um, their, their their cars with, that are being flooded away. So it is really very important uh, to also. Uh, take account of the consumer detriment that is uh, related to environmental detriment. Uh, and uh, what is very important also is to choose solutions that can embrace the consumer role. And what I really need to say here in terms of context is 
that the green transition is all over the place and it, pers- uh, and it um, concerns all of us. All of us, you and I, have to change the way, uh, uh, fundamentally, our lifestyles. It's about the way we eat, the way we travel, the way we move within our cities, the way we insulate or not our house, the way we buy energy efficient appliances and the way we invest, be it for our pensions, be it for just, you know, for just uh, putting our money somewhere or be it uh, to provide loans or mortgages that make it possible for us to have energy efficient uh, lives. And what is very important there is that there is currently a tendency saying that um, let's raise awareness with consumers, let's inform them. And when they're well informed, they will take the right, the sound decision that is more sustainable. Well, th- this is not going through the reality check in a good way because people need a system change. They need to be put in a position where um, the sustainable option in all areas, be it food, investment, uh, energy efficiency, cars, is the most obvious one. It is available, first of all. It is accessible and mainstreaming, and it is affordable. And that means that you really need a vision, a political vision, and a regulatory ecosystem that makes the sustainable option for the consumer the right one. Now, the good news is the majority of people want to act sustainably. The less good news is the framework does not yet exist. And there are two major factors of disempowerment of consumers in this transition. And um, one has already been mentioned quite a lot uh, this morning, which is greenwashing. Greenwashing is all over the place. And that means that people think that they are doing something that is right, that they, so that they are part of the solution, where they are being totally misled and they are part of, they continue to be part of the problem. And the, sec- the second factor that is blocking, uh, the, let's say, the, the consumer role in, in, uh, in the, the move towards more sustainable lifestyles is the lack of comparable information. And so there we really need, uh, I mean, it, we know that it's an investment, it costs money, but we need data, we need them to be reported, we need them to be audited, and we need them to be enforced if something goes wrong. Now, um, what is very important is the right signal being given by the regulatory framework. And there, can I say, I'm a little bit more critical towards the European taxonomy on sustainable finance than my predecessors. Not speaking about the regulation, the the level one regulation, which really sent the right signals. But currently, we are very disappointed that the Commission's delegated act on on sustainable finance for gas, fossil gas and nuclear has given the signal to people that those types of investments are sustainable. Now, we don't disagree that those type of energies need to be part of the transition towards a clean uh, energy system. But it is totally unacceptable from the consumer perspective to make people believe that those are sustainable investment options. So in fact, here we don't only have greenwashing, but we have institutional greenwashing, and that should be prevented at any price. A last point I would like to make is uh, um, about you know, when we speak about sustainable finance, we you think about sustainable investment, but it's also really very important to give the possibilities to consumers to invest into, for example, retrofitting, into uh, buying a car that is uh, more sustainable, in buying more energy efficient appliances. And we see that there is a lot of talk about green loans, but we do not really see mainstream loans that are that provide this possibility for um for green investments that are giving the right incentives to consumers. So there, I think there is major room of improvement to help people make those investments in order to reduce their energy consumption and in order to have a cleaner energy lifestyle, if I can say so. Uh, and there, there would be really, I mean, counting on the, uh, on the financial sector itself, but also on the re- legislator to be more ambitious and to be more, let's say, uh, supporting consumers by, um, uh, giving a premium to those uh, that need money, uh, loans, mortgages, to invest uh, sustainably. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Monique. I think there is a clear commitment also from the consumers uh, to accelerate this transition. And I I think it also acts as a market discipline on all the industry to really move or to move away from what you mentioned, that greenwashing that is all over the places as well. I think it's important uh, that this greenwashing is taken into consideration very heavily from all the parties and all the stakeholders. 
So I would like to thank uh, all the speakers. I, I think there is a clear commitment from the European Union. Uh, we need to go farther uh, beyond transition uh, toward action and at the role of the European Union, uh, regulatory authorities, European Central Bank, consumers, banks, uh, and then uh, uh, promotional banks particularly, very uh, clear as a leader, as a leadership role uh, globally. And again, I thank you very much for the, all the work uh, that has been done. We keep in touch and then to move away from uh, this scenario, what I call it still a reference extractive uh, reference scenario to a transformative scenario uh, that is really leading into uh, uh, complying with the decarbonization uh, with Paris uh, agreements and then uh, all together we can move into this uh, scenario. Thank you very much again and I, I, I will contact you again for the next uh, steps and what we do with uh, this uh, event. Thank you, Jose Manuel. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Monique, online. And I would like to thank Ayla and Sonia from here. And we continue working together towards accelerating the transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.